that the Army released a climate strategy to counter the existential threat that climate change, climate change poses to the service's ability to respond to national security challenges and threats. The strategy is nested within the Department's Climate Adaptation Plan and Interim National Security Strategic Guidance. The Army is focusing its climate preparedness and resilience approach on three lines of effort, installations, acquisitions and logistics, and training. Among the objectives that are outlined in the strategy are the uh, goal to achieve a 50% reduction in Army net greenhouse gas pollution by 2030 compared to 2005 levels, to attain net zero Army greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, uh, and to proactively consider the security implications of climate change in strategy planning acquisition, supply chain, and programming documents and processes. <laughs> All right. We're having problems here. Can I have this bear? <laughs> I'm sure there's more after that. <laughs> the strategy is available on Army.mil, and the Army will be talking about more, more about it in the coming days. And clearly, the Secretary appreciates the work that the Army's doing uh, on these important climate change priorities. Uh, in Africa, the annual training exercise Cutlass Express 2022 is underway after an opening ceremony in Djibouti on the 6th of February. Now in its 20th inter iteration, Cutlass Express is sponsored by U.S. AFRICOM and led by U.S. Naval Forces Europe, Africa, and U.S. Sixth Fleet. The exercise is being conducted in the vicinity of Bahrain, Djibouti, Kenya, Madagascar, Mauritius, and the Seychelles until February 17th. Fourteen nations are participating and will conduct several maritime security exchanges to include vessel queries and ship boardings, airborne maritime patrol operations, and search and rescue drills. The exercise promotes national and regional security in East Africa, increases interoperability between the U.S., African nations, and international partners. Finally, I'd like to announce that the Secretary has approved the next round of DOD advisory boards and committees for resumption of operations. Uh, these are going to be listed in a press release that will be going up on defense.gov here very, very shortly. So you don't have to write all these down, but I will list them. For the record, these boards include the Defense Innovation Board, the National Security Education Board, the National Security Agency Emerging Technologies Panel, the Advisory Board for the National Reconnaissance Office, the Army Education Advisory Committee, the Education for Sea Power Advisory Board, the Board of Visitors for the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program Scientific Advisory Board, and the Board of Regents Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. Positions for these boards will be fi uh, filled in, in coming weeks, and we'll clearly keep you up to date on that. The department's boards and committees have been and will continue to be a valuable resource as we defend the nation, take care of our people, and succeed through teamwork. Uh, and I know that the secretary and all our department leadership look forward to working with these advisory boards going forward. Finally, in light of all that, I'd like to announce that the secretary has nominated Mr. Michael Bloomberg to serve as the chair of the Defense Innovation Board to leverage his experience and strategic in insights on innovation, business, and public service. Mr. Bloomberg, as you all know, uh, an entrepreneur and a leader who served three terms as the mayor of New York City, will bring a wealth of experience in technology, innovation, business, and government to the Defense in Innovation Board. Uh, his, his leadership will be critical to ensuring the department has access to the best and brightest minds in science, technology, and innovation through the team of diverse experts that he will lead as chair of that board. And uh, obviously, the secretary is very grateful that Mr. Bloomberg was willing to take this additional responsibility on and very grateful that he's willing to serve in that capacity. And with that, we'll start taking questions. Bob, over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, two questions related to Ukraine situation. Sure. First, do you, have there been any additional uh, shifting or movement of U.S. troops within Europe, um, units uh, to Eastern Europe? Uh, beyond what you've already described, I think, last week. No, sir. And the second question is regarding the lack of media access to the troops who are on the ground there and who are deploying there. Mm -hmm. Can you just take the, uh, explain what the rationale is for that position of not providing full access? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, the question. And, um, uh, and we obviously have received the the letter from the Pentagon Press Association leadership uh, regarding their concerns over this, and we certainly uh, appreciate you sharing those concerns, and we obviously respect those concerns very much. Um, 
look, any decision to provide media access to our troops, whether it's a, in an operational environment or a training environment, um, is a decision that we, we, we take seriously. Uh, we don't make decisions to grant access or not to grant access lightly. Uh, and there's lots of factors that go into that. Um, uh, uh, sometimes it has to do with operational security. Sometimes it has to do with, with how that kind of access nests into uh, the larger strategy that we're pursuing. So uh, what I would tell you, Bob, is, uh, again, absolutely respect uh, the desire to do it. Uh, uh, I hope you know how much I respect that, too. Uh, we're, we're just not at a point now where uh, we are able to provide that kind of access. And if that changes, believe me, I'll, I'll be the first one to let you know that. But uh, uh, we're still working our way through um, what sort of coverage is, is best suited for this particular mission. Um, uh, and I, I say the following not as a not as an excuse or anything like that, but uh, you know to remind the um, uh, this is a very small number of, of uh, troops that are that are quote unquote deploying, um, and quite a few of them are actually just redeploying inside Europe, and that we have eighty thousand other troops in, in Europe. So the the additions that we're making, uh, while the secretary deems them uh, necessary to reassure our the eastern flank of NATO, uh, they are but a small fraction of the the total number of troops that we have in Europe and have been there and have been there um, again as part of our NATO commitments for a long time. John, is, is it a host country issue or is it a strategic messaging issue? Are you worried that Putin could use the images of U.S. troops arriving in Poland and elsewhere and view it as offensive? I mean, what what is the thinking here? Yeah, I mean, there's a, again, there's a lot that goes into a decision like this, Jen. And uh, uh, and, and some of it is uh, uh, what what is the what is the larger goal here on the geopolitical stage? And and what we've what we've been saying, I think, pretty consistently is that. We believe there's still time and space for diplomacy. We still believe that there's uh, headspace with Mr. Putin that uh, that can be operated inside of. We still believe that uh, that he hasn't made a final decision. And so, a, a lot of what we're doing, not just what we're doing, but how we're talking about what we're doing, is designed um, to make it very clear where the United States national security interests are and what we're trying to achieve here. In a nutshell, what we're trying to achieve here is a de-escalation of the tensions and a diplomatic path forward. And, and virtually everything that we've done, everything I've set up here, and quite frankly, everything I've not set up here, uh, is designed to, to help us get to um, a better outcome, a peaceful outcome, a diplomatic outcome. Uh, nobody wants to see, except with the exception of possibly Mr. Putin, uh, any military conflict breaking out uh, in Europe. So we're being very careful. Um, we're trying to be very deliberate, and um, again, I would just, uh, I would just beg your understanding of that. Just to follow up, the 82nd Airborne that's arriving in Poland. There's the Wall Street Journal report this morning that yeah. they are going to be setting up tents, uh, checkpoints in, in the event that Americans have to be uh, to flee Ukraine. Frankly, if the, if Russia invades, yeah. is that their mission? Can you explain what their mission is? Will there be setting up evacuation points? <clears throat> are you ruling out sending the U.S. military into Ukraine to help evacuate? Um, uh, Americans. There's a lot there. I think you've heard us say consistently um, that there are, are uh, no active efforts in play to militarily evacuate American citizens from Ukraine. Uh, the State Department has been exceedingly consistent and clear uh, about warning Americans uh, from, from away from traveling to Ukraine. And the president himself just uh, the other day um, ad advise Americans to leave Ukraine, given the current tensions. Uh, so there's been plenty of time and opportunity, and it's it's not a war zone. I mean, there, there, there's plenty of physical opportunities to uh, to remove yourself from Ukraine, including commercial air, railroads, good highways. There's lots of ways to, to leave. And, and all that is still at play right now. And again, we've said from the very get-go, there's there's no no effort right now ongoing, uh, nothing that we're expecting to use military assets to move Americans out of Ukraine. That That's the same today. Now, wait, I'm almost there. 
there was a lo lot of questions, and I'm just I'm going to work my way through this. Um, we when the secretary decided to send leading elements of the 82nd Airborne, which we talked about very publicly, um, we said from the very get-go that one of the reasons why we chose that unit is they're multi-mission and they're on a high alert readiness posture as it is. That's their job. That's what they do. And they do a lot of things really, really well, and they can do those things quickly. And we said, and the secretary said, in matter of fact, when he was up at this very podium, that uh, they are multi-mission capable and they're going to be ready to do a number of contingencies, including, and he was asked, you know, would that include evacuation? And he said, if that's what we're called to do, we're capable to do that. So I, I, I can't rule out the fact that uh, these soldiers could be used with some, to, in, in, to some degree with evacuation assistance on the other side of that border, um, and certainly they're going to be prepared to do that. In fact, I've said that my, myself publicly, um, that uh, the uh, ability to contribute to any assistance that might be required, might be required, uh, the 82nd would be prepared to do that. Now, as for what exactly they're, you know, how they're going to prepare for that mission physically and tangibly, um, you know, I don't have anything to, to speak to uh, with great detail today, but that is clearly going to be, is one of the missions that they're capable of doing, trained to do, uh, and will be r ready to do if needed. But Jen, the other thing that's, um, uh, I'd like to just foot stomp, and it kind of goes back to what I said at the risk of sounding redundant, um, if Americans that are in Ukraine heed the warnings that they have gotten from the State Department and from the President himself, there should be no need for the 82nd Airborne uh, to have to assist with evacuation assist uh, uh, evacuation missions. Uh, if uh, if Americans that are in Ukraine are are, uh, are paying close attention to the to the warnings and the advisories that they've gotten and uh, and do the right thing while there's time to do it. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. It was a long one. I appreciate your patience. Megan. Uh, can we get an update on the groups of troops who are newly arrived uh, or newly moved around in Europe? How many has, have made it to Romania? How many have made it to Germany? How many have made it to Poland? And also, well, you, Jen asked about the Wall Street Journal and the Poland situation. In Romania, what are they going to be doing? In Germany, at the command headquarters, what are they going? What is their, what are their days going to look like once they're all settled? Yeah, in? the the striker squadron. I think they're leaving Germany today. Um, it's going to take them some some days to get to Romania. I think there's some very small leading elements, as you might expect. It, it, uh, when the army moves, they always move some leading elements. So there's a there's a there's some small elements. Uh, uh, already in Romania preparing for the rest to come. Uh, they'll be operating uh, uh, with the, our Romanian counterparts. Um, uh, I don't have anything more detailed than that. I'd point you to UCOM to, to really speak to that. But they're, remember, they're really going to, to reassure uh, and to be able to provide additional capability uh, in Romania. I would also remind, Megan, there's, another, there's already 900 uh, so this uh, this thousand almost doubles what we already had in, in Romania. Um, nothing really significant changes in terms of the 82nd Airborne. They continue to flow in in tranches. So um, of the 1,700 that we said were going, um, uh, less than half um, are already th are there, and and the rest will flow in over the next few days. And again, they will be establishing themselves, as I answered to Jen, uh, uh, to be able to respond to multiple contingencies and to, to conduct whatever missions they're called on to do. One of them could very well be uh, preparing uh, for some sort of evacuation assistance on the Polish side of that border. So to follow up, the Army's Fifth Corps has a headquarters in Poland that they stood up recently ostensibly for this sort of mission. Are they being involved at all in any of this? Or, you know, were they, were they considered to be involved in any of these deployments? Yeah, I mean, I think they're absolutely involved. And I think uh, uh, the striker squadron sort of reports up through that chain of command as well. Um, I'd point you to UCOM to speak with more specificity uh, about how, they're, how the head, different headquarters are going to be broken down. Yeah, Jenny. Thank you, John. Um, I have a question on the Korea, China, and North Korea. And the first question is the, uh, the three party, US and South Korea, Japan. I mean, Defense ministers meeting will held, will held be soon. Is that date set yet? 
I'm sorry, is that what? Defense ministers, three party talks, the South Korea, US, Japan, defense ministers, yeah. meeting will be held soon. Okay. It announced uh, yesterday. Yeah. Is date set yet? It, it, is, is it? I mean, date. When is will there, be the Is there a date? date? Yes. Oh, I think we'll have very we'll have a more to talk about that um, pretty soon. I think I'll. Means pretty soon. <laughs> means very soon. Pretty soon is how soon? It's very soon. Well, you didn't mention the date, but I yeah, no, I didn't mention the date. But it's another case. okay, skip that anyway. Skip that anyway. Yeah, I I find that very soon. And uh, the other one, the <clears throat> North Korea's ICBM missile operating base which is located just 50 miles from the Chinese border. Uh, aren't you worried about this? What is uh, DOD's uh, opinion on this? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I, Pay attention, I, please. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, North Korea has I get ice, that a lot. I was know. just looking to see. <laughs> I was just looking to see if I had more on your first question. Um, Schooling going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, on the, North Korea, on the North Koreans uh, ICBM missile operating base, which is located just 15 miles from the Chinese border. So I'm too worried about this. If I don't have any information on that, Jenny. Why not? I don't have any information on the installation status in, in North Korea. Give another one. Uh, China has uh, placed two support for Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine. And also, North Korea also said that uh, it supports Russia through face to face meeting with uh, Russian Putin recently. So, what is the United States' strategy toward China and North Korea? Do you have any new strategy? I, I don't. I mean, are you referring to the the, the readout of the conversation between Xi and Putin? Yes, because the Chinese uh, pleased, the, you know, they involved the Russian uh, crisis. They strongly promised with Putin. And also, North Korean Kim Jong-un face-to-face the meeting with the Russian authority. He also supported Russia to involve Ukraine crisis. I mean, so if those China and North Korea involve Ukraine crisis, so do you have any new strategy? I mean, do they have any strategy? A strategy? The, yeah, toward China and North Korea. I, I don't so, have any new strategy with respect to China and North Korea and whatever statements they might have made in support of what Mr. Putin is doing. Uh, we're focused on, uh, again, trying to find a diplomatic path forward here uh, so that this doesn't devolve into conflict over Ukraine uh, and to make sure that we're shoring up our, our, uh, uh, our contributions to the NATO alliance, which we take very seriously. Uh, I'll only say what I've said before. I mean, these two countries, Russia and China, are not countries with a whole lot of friends. Uh, and aren't part of aren't part of broader alliance systems uh, that they can rely on. And every indication that we've seen is this. Uh, in recent days, here, this is more of a partnership of convenience, if anything else, between Xi and, and Putin. And and, uh, and and these are not two countries that are uniformly aligned on every issue. Um, so they can speak for themselves, and what what they put out in their little communique, that's that's fine. Uh, we're focused on making sure that we are committed to the NATO alliance, uh, that, 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 that that's obvious, uh, and to try to find a diplomatic path forward here. Orrin. Uh, last seen a colleague, Nick Matt Walsh, is reporting based on uh, trips to Afghanistan and, and medical records, as well as interviews with doctors, victims, and witnesses, none of whom were interviewed by U.S. military investigators, that there are further questions about the, the role gunfire may have played mm -hmm. in the immediate aftermath of the suicide bombing at Abbey Gate. Uh, 
Should the Pentagon further investigate this matter, or does Pentagon leadership feel that the matter has been satisfactorily investigated to this point? The investigation, we believe, was comprehensive, it was credible, um, and it was quite definitive. And, uh, Orrin, I think you were here in the room when the investigating team uh, came up here and, and laid it out for you over the course of an hour or more. Uh, pretty detailed uh, work. And uh, as, um, as they said, and I'm, I'm quite frankly quoting from their work, the investigation found no definitive proof that anyone was ever hit or killed by gunfire, either U.S. or Afghan. Um, and I think I'd leave it at that. Uh, let me go to the phones here. Uh, Carl, I promise I won't forget you, but I haven't done anybody here. Uh, Travis Tritton from Military.com. Hey, John, thanks. Uh, most of my questions were asked, but um, I did want to ask, there it looks like there may be an agreement on the Hill on annual defense funding. And I know there was a lot of dire talk uh, from the, the military branches about the effects of a CR. And I was wondering if you could just um, uh, talk about the current situation in DOD and how you're faring on a stopgap uh, budget measure. Thanks. It's not for us to, uh, to, to, to speak to a stopgap spending measure. It's really for Congress to speak to that. And we, and we certainly hope that, uh, uh, that we can get full funding for the year uh, and not, uh, obviously not another CR that takes us yet another month or two. Uh, what the Secretary has been very clear about is the importance of four-year funding and, and what that does for us. I mean, with a CR, as you know, Travis, we can't start new programs. You can't build new ships. You, we, we're going to have to delay uh, 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 perhaps as much as 100 military construction projects. And when you do that, it's not just the military installations that are affected. It's the local communities and local businesses uh, around those installations that will suffer. In order to pay for the 2.7 percent pay increase that we want to give our troops, much deserved, by the way, uh, that, that money is going to have to come from other accounts, and that, and that could eat into operational readiness as well. Uh, it, it, it could affect uh, health care funding for military families. So um, all of these things are at stake. The ability to, to conduct new research and development in new important technologies like microelectronics, like artificial intelligence, like hypersonics, all of that would have to be slowed down if we don't get full-year funding. So uh, we've been nothing but clear. The service chiefs were up on the Hill, uh, a week or so ago, I think they laid it out in very specific terms what, uh, what living under a continuing resolution uh, means. Uh, you described it as dire talk, and, uh, and frankly, I think we would agree with that, that uh, there, are, there, there could be dire consequences if we can't get four-year funding for this year. Now, look, the Congress has never failed to, to appropriate uh, for us in, in the past, and, uh, uh, and, and the Secretary's uh, uh, obviously interested in, in, uh, in making sure we get that four-year funding. We, uh, we certainly call on the Congress to, uh, to do what they've always done, uh, and that is to, to support the department with, uh, with funding for a full year, uh, as was authorized. Um, Kasim from Anayu. Uh, yes, John, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Washington Post had uh, acquired, actually, an Army investigation on withdrawal from Afghanistan. And in that report, uh, Brigadier General uh, Sullivan uh, told investigators that he wanted to stage supplies to host 5,000 evacuees at Kabul airport, but his efforts was complicated because he was not permitted to discuss the possibility of a full-scale evacuation with anyone other than British officials. So my question is, why would the U.S. prefer not to be transparent to the partners? who without hesitation took arms to support the U.S. after 9-11. So first of all, what The Washington Post is reporting on are the, the raw materials that went into the Abby Gaten investigation, which you all uh, were, were briefed on Friday. Uh, so uh, these documents uh, that were released under the Freedom of Information Act are really the raw material that went to that investigation uh, about Abby Gate. Uh, and in the course of that investigation, clearly lots of uh, lots of questions were asked and, and answered. I, I would refer you to the documents. I'm, uh, I'm not going to be in a position where I'm uh, uh, relitigating uh, every single statement made uh, across the course of what is about 2,000 uh, pages. What I would tell you is this. This was a tough mission over the course of 17 days. And what those documents reveal, if you look at any of them, is a lot of good people 
And I'm not just talking about in the military. I'm talking about with our State Department colleagues and, our, and to your point, uh, our coalition partners and allies. A lot of good people making a lot of tough decisions in unrelenting circumstances, very difficult circumstances, uh, with as an increasingly desperate uh, crowd of Afghans who were trying to, to leave the country. Um, and we've been nothing but honest and open about the fact that it wasn't perfect in every regard. We've got an after action review going on right now. We're going to learn from the mistakes were made. Uh, but we're also very proud uh, of the fact that together with our interagency colleagues at the State Department, uh, brave diplomats who are on those gates with our Marines, uh, with our coalition and allied partners, that 124,000 people were safely evacuated from Afghanistan. That's no mean feat. You know, one of the things we don't talk about today is the fact that uh, we've got just over 6,000 now um, Afghans that are on two military bases here at home. I mean, tens of thousands of Afghans are now starting new lives in this country because of the work that the interagency did, not just the military. We housed them and provided a safe and secure environment. But HHS was involved, and DHS was involved, and the State Department was involved. There was a lot of good work that was done here. Now, I'm not going to relitigate every single document in that, um, in that trove there that's on the, uh, on the FOIA website. You can read it for yourself. But I would beseech you, as you do that, to just not forget the larger perspective here of what we were able to get done. Mike Brest, Washington Examiner. Well, Mr. Kirby, thanks for taking my question. Back in December, you said that there were active discussions going on about mandating the coronavirus booster vaccine. Uh, where does that stand right now? Uh, no uh, decisions to speak to, Mike, uh, with respect to any decisions on uh, um, making the booster mandatory. I, I think we're, we're still examining that. Joe Gould, Defense News. Hi, John. Thanks for taking my call. Um, the um, American Federation of Government Employees, it's uh, America's largest federal employee union, um, wrote a letter urging lawmakers to repeal a series of caps on civilian workers at, uh, you know, Pentagon headquarters functions. And their argument is that um, those roles are being filled by um, a, uh, an inflated contractor workforce. Um, would uh, the Pentagon uh, welcome that move by lawmakers if, if they decide to uh, follow the recommendation of, um, of the union? Joe, I'm going to have to take your question there, partner. I am not aware of that letter or that issue, and uh, I don't think it'd be good for me to speculate on that. So let me take that question. We'll get back to you. Carla. Thanks. Just Joe, going back really quickly to Jen and to Bob's question. So can you confirm the details that troops that are currently in Poland are setting up tents checkpoints and other things to prepare for an evacuation currently? I know of no tents that are being set up right now, Carla. Again, there's only sort of less than half of the leading elements that are there, the 1700 that we talked about. Um, that's not the whole of the 82nd Airborne, uh, 1700. Um, uh, so it's, it's not even the whole unit itself. And that 1700, about less than half of them are on the ground right now. Um, I, I can't speak to uh, specifically whether tents are being set up. Again, they would be prepared to do that kind of thing. Uh, and I, I, I certainly am not going to rule out that in coming days or weeks uh, that they might be setting up um, some temporary facilities just in case there's a need to, in, in case there are uh, Americans who are, are coming across that border and need help. They're trained to do that. They're trained to do a lot of things. That's, that's one thing they're trained to do. Uh, but uh, this isn't, and we've been very clear, we're not talking about a a classic non-combatant evacuation operation where you're sending in gray tails and flying people out. That's, that's not what's envisioned here. And frankly, I, I, again, I, I hate to be redundant, but I'm going to be, it, it, it doesn't need to come to that. I mean, I mean if, if, if things work out the way they should, there'll be no reason uh, for them to handle any evacuees because there won't have been an invasion, another invasion by Mr. Putin and Russian military forces. And even if that is the course that happens, another invasion, um, if Americans are listening, listening carefully and following the guidance by the State Department and by the President of the United States, they should be leaving now. They, they should have been leaving before now. And there's plenty of ways to do that, just by going to Kiev and jumping on an airplane and leaving, or getting in a car and, and driving across the country. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, there, there's, it's not a military conflict zone right now. And there's no reason why it should. Been designated as the evacuation point. Should it come to that? Uh, I know of 
I, I don't think that there's a we've designated specific evacuation points in this. This will be something that the 82nd and the, and the General Walters, as a European command commander, would be thinking about. I, I don't know if he's made final decisions on that right now. Again, um, uh, there, we want to be ready for everything. We would ask that Americans in Ukraine also make themselves ready. Uh, and do the right thing uh, for themselves and for their families and, and not travel to Ukraine, and if they're in Ukraine, to leave Ukraine. While there's time and certainly every capacity and capability to do so safely and efficiently through normal commercial transportation. And then lastly, um, you said that no additional troops have gone to Europe, but have any additional troops in the United States been placed on high alert since you last updated us? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, first, I have a question on Ukraine. So you're asking thousands of, of Americans, families, to abandon their lives in Ukraine and leave, which is not an easy decision to make, as, as you know. Why should they do that? Based on what? Up until now, you say, we don't know. We're, we don't think Putin has made a decision. We don't have the intelligence to say whether this is going to happen or not. So you're asking them to make such a crucial decision mm -hmm. that will have major implications on their lives without giving them any real information that there's an imminent threat. I mean, that's what I'm getting at. No, Fadi, I think I'm going to take issue with the question there. First of all, uh, we're advising them uh, to, to do this, and uh, the State Department has, I don't want to speak for my State Department colleagues, but they've been very clear uh, about that guidance and that, and that advice. Obviously, uh, we can't make them do it. They have to make those decisions for themselves. Uh, um, and. Uh, I think, Fadi, you've been sitting on these briefings uh, as well as anybody else. We've been nothing but clear about the continued military buildup along that border with Ukraine and in Belarus uh, and the continued military options that Mr. Putin has available to him. Uh, we have been, I think, ex extraordinarily transparent um, uh, about uh, the possibilities uh, of military conflict inside Ukraine. Um, and so we've made no bones about that. And, it, and in our best judgment as a government, our advice is that this is not the time uh, to be going to Ukraine. It's not the time to be staying in Ukraine. Each of these families, you're right. These, we're not saying they're easy decisions. We understand that. And they're going to have to make these decisions for themselves and as appropriate. All, all we can do, all we must do as a government is give them the best advice and guidance we can based on the information that we're seeing uh, and, what, and what we know to be the case on the ground. So that's what we're doing. Okay, can I ask another question, please? Sure. So do you, um, I, I asked um, a couple of days ago, again, about the uh, operation against ISIS leader Horashi, northeastern Syria. Do you have any updates on whether you revised the number of civilian casualties during that operation? I don't. Okay. Tony Capaccio, Bloomberg. Hey, Jen, sorry, I accidentally muted myself. I have a budget question, FY23 budget question. Yesterday, Secretary Wormuth confirmed that the DOD has not yet received its top-line guidance from OMB, which isn't surprising since DOD set over its desired number uh, in mid-January. But here's my question. What is the current DOD inflation estimate for FY23? It was 2.2% for, 20, for 22. There's a lot of interest in this subject. And... I know DOD has an inflation estimate for 23. Uh, what is it? Tony, I'll, I, I will take your question. Uh, Sylvie? That'd be good. Written answer. Hello. Hello, uh, John. Thank you. Um, I have actually uh, three questions. First, I want to know um, if you have uh, any, if you have any, any indication about more Russian troops arrivals uh, at the border with Ukraine. Uh, I want to know if you have any detail on the arrival of uh, Russian bombers in Kaliningrad. And also, uh, the Russian uh, uh, chief of defense, General Gerasimov, uh, has arrived in Belarus today um, uh, as the uh, uh, exercise, military exercise is going to start. I wanted to know if for you it's something usual or if you find his uh, presence on the ground concerning. Concerned by his presence on the ground, he's the chief of defense for 
uh, for his military. It's not uncommon for chiefs of defense to observe exercises. I think you have to look at it in the context of what's going on, obviously. Um, we're not looking at this exercise in a vacuum. Um, uh, and we, we understand that senior military leaders are very much involved in facilitating this buildup, a buildup which we believe is destabilizing and unnecessary, uh, has nothing to do, uh, since, since NATO is not a threat uh, to Russian sovereignty, since Ukraine is not a threat to Russian sovereignty, there should be no reason for this buildup. So we obviously are viewing this certainly in light of what's going on, but, uh, but his presence alone at this exercise is not setting off alarm bells here at the Pentagon. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, Russian bomber deployments. Um, I, I've, I think I've made it very clear, and I'll continue to do so, that I am not going to put the uh, United States Department of Defense in the position of speaking to Russian military movements with great specificity. Um, uh, that uh, we, we can speak for our own, um, but I'm not going to uh, detail on a day-to-day -day basis uh, every movement of every unit inside uh, the Russian armed forces. Um, and as for uh, troop numbers uh, build up, your first question, we have continued to see, even over the last 24 hours, additional capabilities flow uh, from elsewhere in Russia to that border with Ukraine and in Belarus. Uh, as before, we're not going to get into it, uh, uh, providing specific numbers, but, that, but the numbers continue to grow. Uh, we maintain that he's uh, north uh, of 100,000 for sure, uh, and he continues to add to that capability. We also see indications that additional battalion tactical groups are on their way. Uh, and so every day he adds to his options, every day he adds to his capabilities, every day um, he continues to destabilize uh, what is already a very tense situation. And he could easily destabilize by moving these forces back home um, and by committing to a diplomatic path forward. Caitlin Dornboss from uh, Stars and Stripes. Hey John, um, following up on some previous questions, I know you've got no ongoing plans for evacuation, but I just want to see if you can confirm that the Pentagon has received approval from the White House to evacuate civilians from Ukraine should Russia invade. And then also, I know you'd be, you'd be in pretty tight-lipped on north of 100,000, but I, I think we're, we've been at north of 100,000 for about six weeks now. Is there anything more you can give us as far as and I've seen reporting of all the way up to 140,000 or 170,000. Thank you. Not today. Nope, Caitlin, I'm just going to stick it north of 100,000. Um, but he does continue to add to his capabilities. And, and look, in terms of the uh, approval process, I mean, you guys have been covering this place long enough, you know. I mean, the secretary is the, uh, the top of the chain of command here in the military, at the department anyway. Uh, the commander in chief, the president, is at the top, top of the chain of command uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, the use of the United States military. So um, the secretary issues the orders, but on uh, on an issue of, of this importance from a geopolitical perspective, of course there's going to be interagency discussion, and of course um, there's going to be uh, the involvement uh, by, by the president in decisions of this nature. Uh, Nancy Youssef. Thank you. I'd like to go back to your answers about um, embedding and why um, journalists can't do. So um, you said that among the reasons was um, that embedding was um, that you were considering the national security interests and that the U.S. wanted diplomacy to play out. But journalists were embedded in the run up to the 2003 invasion when the U.S. also was hoping diplomacy would prevail. And I'm having a hard time understanding how less transparency reflects the national security interests of a nation that promotes freedom of press worldwide. So I was hoping you could give us more a more specific answer on why journalists can't embed with deployed troops and what the process will be going forward in light of the PPA letter. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. I, I do think, um, uh, again, I, I stand by what I said to Bob. We obviously uh, respect the job that you do and appreciate it. Um, and we try to provide as much uh, transparency and access as we can. It, it oftentimes is not as much as you want, and, and I get there's an actual tension there. There are a lot of factors that go into making decisions about um, access to you. I mean, even just how many briefings we're going to do every week is, is not something we do accidentally. Um, we make these decisions very deliberately, and they are nested inside larger national security goals and, and national security efforts, uh, and I fully appreciate that not all of our decisions are going to be popular. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I do think uh, comparing this to 2003 in Iraq is not a fair comparison. 
th this is a this is a modest number of forces uh, that are redeploying or I'm sorry relocating um, uh, to uh, to provide reassurance to allies um, and uh, uh, and as as measured against the percentage of eighty some odd thousand troops that are already in Europe it's a, it's a pretty s small uh, addition um, and it's really done about uh, uh, on reassurance. Uh, so uh, if there's a change in the approach that uh, that we're going to take here at the department, I will absolutely let you know. I do appreciate uh, the concerns that have been uh, very clearly communicated. Uh, and again, uh, we, we respect those concerns and uh, um, and uh, we have obviously duly passed those concerns on up the chain of command. Uh, Pierre. John. I'm here, shipmate. You there? Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, Iran today announced that they have a new ballistic missile. Do you have any early assessment of uh, uh, this uh, missile, uh, if, if it is also dangerous to uh, U.S. soldiers and to allies in the area? I have not seen the announcement by Iran that they have a new ballistic missile program, so I, you know, I don't have any specific to say that. That said, uh, we have uh, uh, continually watched as Iran has improved their ballistic missile program, uh, and we are keenly aware of uh, the regional threats that that ballistic missile program uh, poses, which is why we're working so hard with allies and partners in the region to be able to counter those kinds of threats uh, and to make sure that we are contributing to their self-defense needs as well. Okay, I've got time for one more, and I'd like to go to Anna Maria from Romania TV. Okay. Looks like Anna Maria was not there. Does anybody else have one more? On sure. He was referring today the uh, Iran uh, revealed a new uh, missile. It's uh, the Khaybar uh, uh, Shikan. It's um, 900 miles and it, it runs on solid fuel. So it, it puts uh, U.S. bases in Israel within within range. And then it's it's been announced today at the heels of the new round of negotiations in, in Vienna concerning the Iran nuclear, nuclear program. So how, how do, you, do you think Iran is messaging something to, uh, to the U.S. and Israel? And Again, I can't speak to this announcement, Fadi. I haven't seen it. So I, I'd rather reserve comment on a missile they claim they have. Uh, I just don't have anything specific on that. Uh, you guys are, as always, a little bit ahead of me in terms of what's out there in the news space. Um, but as to your question, are they are they messaging? Uh, frank, frankly, we see their malign activities as much more than messaging. I mean, they are malign activities on their own. They are destabilizing in the region. They're supporting terrorist groups uh, across the region. Uh, they are harassing maritime shipping. They are advancing a ballistic missile program that is designed for offensive purposes to uh, to inflict harm and damage, uh, potentially lethal so, uh, on uh, on other states, other peoples. Uh, and our allies and partners. Um, we, don't, we don't look at this as a messaging issue. We look at it as a legitimate national security threat issue uh, in the region to our people, to our facilities, and to those of our allies and partners. All right. Thanks, everybody.